Okay, well, I'm Bob McCauley, and I'm the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture at Emory University. Uh, the center has existed for six years now. Uh, and it really has a two-part mission, which is to say that it's concerned with um, simultaneously fostering interdisciplinary research, but as I've said on other occasions, multidisciplinary research on uh, mind, brain, and culture and their connections with one another, um, and teaching. Uh, and then uh, also to showcase, uh, especially research, uh, on mind, brain, and culture that occurs at Emory. I mean, part of the issue was that although we have at our university a number of people who have played a very prominent role in the world of cognitive science in one form or other, because it, it is a big world, uh, we didn't actually have a kind of institutional in-house setting, so to speak, with which they might be, among other things, readily identified. There was no cognitive science center at Emory. Uh, all of the, you know, the presence of people like Larry Barcelo or Franz Duval or Bradshaw or any number of other people. Um, and uh, mostly what we do is try to serve as a catalyst uh, to get these folks together, to give them opportunities to present their research, get them op give them opportunities to be talking and interacting with one another. Um, um, and we have uh, been successful in, uh, as it were, helping people end up establishing collaborations uh, because they've met through our programs. Um, but we're also, we have a training mission in one regard, and that is we have a graduate certificate program uh, in America uh, at a lot of major research universities. The way this works is that a certificate is, uh, actually, I've, again, I guess I would mostly use American idioms to describe it, but it's in effect a kind of minor for a PhD student. It's a way of sort of showing interdisciplinary um, experience and education. Uh, so we have a certificate in mind, brain, and culture, and uh, we have in the first three years uh, 10 students who have uh, registered for that certificate to pursue it. Uh, they represent, if I remember correctly, I believe seven different departments or programs at Emory, uh, spanning all the way from uh, the humanities. And we have, we've had one philosopher, we've had one person from religious studies, we've had one person from women's studies, uh, right through to neuroscience. Uh, we have uh, currently two students from the neuroscience program and actually anthropologists, psychologists, uh, as well. Well, I've, I've devoted a good deal of my career as a philosopher of science to thinking about reductionism, uh, frankly, because of my experiences in religious studies from a very early stage in my, uh, actually, my uh, career as a student. Um, and um, in short, I guess my argument would be that. Uh, is the charge of reductionism correct at a certain level? The answer to that is yes. However, uh, is that any reason to perceive uh, the activity, the endeavor, the inquiry as a, as a menace or a threat? And the answer to that is unequivocally no. And it's unequivocally no for two reasons, uh, because there are basically two sort of broad possibilities here. And that is either the uh, kinds of interests, the kinds of findings, the kinds of even assumptions, and, and you know, to the extent that there are theories in religious studies, uh, to the extent that those map on to um, uh, work in cognitive science, uh, uh, and, and cognitive science of religion in particular neatly uh, or cleanly, uh, that on all the classical conceptions of, of reduction simply indicates that there's a vindication of those theories. So that's not a threat. But of course, that mapping is actually in all of the sciences. To be so neat is actually a comparatively rare thing. Uh, but what's the other option? Well, the other option, presumably, I mean, we're on a continuum here and there's lots of middle options, but presumably the other extreme option is there isn't any good mapping at all and that these two sorts of accounts seem to be quite discontinuous with one another. Um, 
Well, in short, that's a possibility that has arisen in lots of other settings in science. And um, that doesn't lead to any deleterious uh, outcomes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, what it does is it requires that the two endeavors work to mutually inform one another. Uh, oftentimes, in lots of reductionistic writing by certain sorts of, of folks who have various axes to grind, uh, the uh, story will be one that looks for, as it were, all the corrections to come from the bottom up. So that sort of, you know, the, the, the physical sciences will correct the biological sciences, the biological sciences will correct the psychological sciences, and all of these sciences will correct, you know, the speculations of humanists. Um, in fact, that's a false claim. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, examples in the history of science uh, and, in, frankly, in contemporary science um, where the corrections actually come from the top down, where the lower level science is improved because of the influence of the upper level science. And there are classic examples of this. Um, uh, as, you know, my, my, as I've said, my all-time favorite example is, is looking to uh, controversies about the age of the earth in the 19th century. Uh, Darwin uh, published The Origin of Species in 1859, and he, Darwin, the genius that he was, of course, among other things, recognized he needed an earth that was really, really old because evolution on the Darwinian gradualist conception was going to have to take a long time to pr produce such diverse species, such variability. But the leading physics of his time said the Earth wasn't so old. In fact, Lord Kelvin estimated it was roughly 100,000 years old, and Darwin knew that was a problem. Uh, so he was very interested in trying to, you know, sort of see if there was a case to be made for the age, uh, a much older Earth. Uh, well, subsequently, uh, with the developments in physics that actually came after Kelvin died uh, in the 20th century, we understand that he. Uh, didn't include all the factors that should have been included in the, the calculations actually about the temperatures, the temperature of the Earth. Um, and it turns out Darwin was right. Uh, the upper level theory got it right, the lower level theory got it wrong, and um, the lower level theory benefited by the very provocation that at least other sciences with which the hope is, is that in the long, in the big picture, there would be some coherence um, required a much, much older Earth. Uh, another example at the cultural level, uh, where in fact we have uh, uh, a case where we've got, as it were, what I would broadly call uh, research from the socio-cultural sciences, that family of sciences, uh, corrects, um, um, it looks like it's correcting biological science. This has to do with, among other things, controversies about the evolution of languages. Uh, and it pertains to a very specific case um, having to do with the evolution of languages across, in effect, the South Pacific. Uh, one theory, um, probably most popularly known by way of Jared Diamond uh, in his um, aptly titled uh, chapter in Guns, Germs, and Steel called Speedboat to Polynesia, uh, argues that in fact there's just a sweeping motion, movement of population and language uh, south and then southeast out of Taiwan. Uh, by contrast, there are, uh, and, and he did this mostly on preliminary research about the languages in question. I take it language as a cultural entity first and foremost, we think of it that way, though of course you can think about it psycholog psychologically as well. There's a long tradition in cognitive science of doing that. Um, by contrast, um, ever since we've, you know, sort of gotten information about the genomes of people all over the world, uh, there's been a great deal of attention given to the study of the Y chromosomes in males, uh, the mitochondrial DNA in females, which are uh, come down directly um, across generations. And the suggestion was that, in fact, the genetic evidence seemed to be suggesting that instead of this sort of sweep south, southeastward sweep out of, out of China and out of Taiwan in particular, um, that in fact there were sort of two uh, uh, 
migrations of populations and then presumably of languages and changes of languages um, between, uh, from Indonesia, uh, sort of going due east and actually sort of northward back up toward Indochina. Uh, um, uh, a couple of, of uh, well, uh, Russell Gray, a uh, researcher in New Zealand, uh, in fact, and his colleagues, uh, borrowed a set of tools and uh, actually from the biological sciences. Uh, biologists are interested in, in the phylogenies of species. Uh, that is to say, you know, in short, what's the evolutionary story, say, for the human species, right, or any other species? Um, well, Gray used some of these tools to study uh, the evolution of languages and actually simple computational techniques that simply involved uh, uh, similarities between lexical units across languages. Um, it's a big computational task, but actually they just focused on a sort of a hundred standard words out of a number of languages in this area. And what they found was evidence that unequivocally seemed to corroborate the out of Taiwan, uh, the southward out of Taiwan hypothesis. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it, it addressed that, but you might say, well, yeah, but that was a cultural hypothesis in the first place. Fair enough. But what it also suggested was that, in fact, and indeed upon sort of rethinking this, the suggestion is, is that there may be a bias in the interpretation of the genetic evidence, which is to say that what we're looking at is uh, movements of populations in just the last few thousand years. Uh, I mean, exactly how many candidly, I don't know. I mean, I think about 5,000 years or so, uh, maybe a little less than that, actually. And of course, there's a great deal of variability just out there. Uh, you know, um, our mutation rate has got a particular average and it produces uh, variability. But indeed, when you're looking at genetic variation over very short recent time frames, you've got a lot of variation that is, as it were, going to be overestimated because a lot of these variants are never going to stick in the population. So it's not just the case that this evidence, as it were, unequivocally tilts towards one of these hypotheses in contrast to the other. Uh, but it also even motivated people to begin to rethink the techniques used at the lower level science and to begin to realize there was a bias in that and, as it were, constitute a correction of how that sort of evidence is used. Um, is there elimination? Uh, well. Elimination certainly occurs in science. Um, that is to say, one of the other possibilities for talking about this kind of incongruity between positions would be uh, uh, not just that you know X, perhaps religion, is nothing but Y, but in fact X just isn't even there, right? Um, and again, there are some philosophers who've tried to suggest that that kind of uh, outcome can arise in these settings, and um, I, I don't. I beg to differ. Um, that is to say, it seems to me that the eliminations in science never arise this way. Um, that they are routinely a function of, except at the very earliest stages of a science development, when in fact it's still not quite yet fully recognized as a discipline. But once a discipline is up and rolling and it's got, um, literally, it has a name, so that you're no longer a natural philosopher, you're a chemist. Uh, or you're no longer a natural philosopher, you're a biologist. Uh, it has a name, um, it has journals, it has professional societies, it has departments named correspondingly. Um, I think that there's virtually no historical evidence whatsoever that any of this kind of um, looking at cross-scientific relations has ever generated any elimination in science. Uh, Eliminations in science occur uh, within disciplines over time. Uh, so that, um, and that change, that kind of elimination, if it occurs, can be very, very rapid. And that's what Thomas Kuhn described when he described scientific revolutions. Or sometimes it can be extremely slow and gradual. Uh, because the other option is, is there is a kind of analog of Darwinian gradualism. Uh, in the development of science in the sense that some of these changes occur very slowly. Uh, again, one illustration of that would be uh, changes, but not eliminations, inertia. 
concept of inertia and its change across uh, uh, physical thinking from the Middle Ages uh, right through to, I mean, contemporary physics. Uh, another great example, by the way, is planets. The concept of planets has been with us since the ancient world. Uh, its extension has changed. It's, ex it's, of course, as I think many people know, it's, it's, it's changed even in the last decade which is to say Pluto has sort of been demoted. Um, and, um, uh, but the concept is retained, but its uh, meaning and its extension gets changed over the evolution, the evolution of theories. Uh, but over, as it were, again, the evolution of theories, some, some ideas do disappear. One of my favorite examples, again, using phys physical sciences, is um, Galileo's uh, retention of the medieval notion of a natural motion. Um, he has inertia. He has natural motion in his account, in his conception of, of uh, mechanics. Um, but uh, in fact, natural motion disappears in subsequent physical theorizing, certainly by Newton. It's gone. Uh, inertia is still there. but Natural motions are gone. Um, eliminations don't occur in these kinds of relationships, and I take it the critical one you're concerned with is the relationship between broadly religious studies and specifically uh, work in the cognitive science of religion. Uh, that kind of uh, vertical uh, relation, uh, the cross-scientific relation, doesn't result in eliminations. If it does lead to wonderful mapping, then you get vindication. And if it doesn't lead to mapping, what you get is this kind of mutual enrichment, just like the Darwin-Kelvin case. Uh, and there are lots of other cases I could offer, but I take it we've got limited time.